This episode of Shit Island was funded by the Donald Trump National Emergency Foundation because there is a crisis going on, and the crisis is not enough college students talking about Marxism. That's right. Welcome to Shit Island. Yes, welcome. Indeed. And thank you, Donald Trump and the Republican administration for funding this, along with uh, George Soros, who uh, has yep. sponsored us very diligently and uh, in a very professional manner and discreet manner, which we appreciate as leftists. So thank you to those two white gentlemen. Yeah, thank you to Alex Jones mm -hmm. uh, for his donation. And thank you, patrons. Join now. Yes. Oh, uh, yeah. I guess, I guess they count as well. I guess. I guess. We're back once again. We are. Apologies for the delay. Yeah. Yes. Uh, it's, yeah, so we, uh, Peter Redtron had some technical issues last week, so... But uh, don't worry, he's been fixed, so uh, we can do it this time. So, we have some topics planned for today, the first of which concerns TERFs. Mm -hmm. My favourite topic. And Not really, I, I hate them. And since it's your favorite topic, Jules, <laughs> uh, why don't you introduce the viewers oh, or listeners, gladly. I guess. Okay, um, TERFs, the uh, acronym standing for Trans Exclusionary Radical Feminists. So, uh, yeah, they're, uh, you know, feminists, radical feminists even. But for some reason, they really, really don't like trans people mm -hmm. uh, of all kinds, not just they tend to focus on trans women, they also don't like trans men, but most of their focus is on trans women. I feel like um, from the, the TERFs that I have seen, they hate trans women and they don't believe trans men exist. Yes. Basically, yeah. They basically, basically yes. think that trans men are just like edgy tomboys. Yeah, yeah basically. They don't view them as men, they, they still view them as women, which is why they don't hate them as much, I guess, because... Mm -hmm. No, they're women to them. Yeah, one of the most yeah. prominent TERFs, Jermaine Greer from Australia, um, will do a lot of lip service to this idea that she doesn't actually hate trans men, but she doesn't believe that they are women, basically, and that they are like inherently committing a, a crime against linguistics and women uh, by saying that they're <laughs> women. <laughs> Very specific, a crime against linguistics. Yeah. <laughs> Now there's a thing you want to be arrested for, a crime against linguistics. <laughs> <laughs> now, TERFs are pretty terrible. Um, they're very widespread in Denmark, from my experience, uh, among especially university professors. I've had to deal with a, a, quite a few of them, and I think in ac they're most prominent in academia because of the radical feminist point of it in TERFs themselves. Uh, um, like... Radical feminists are kind of far and few between, but I feel like if you were to find them, you would find them at universities preaching to others. So it's kind of a self-sustaining, tiny little group of um, mostly women who uh, grew up uh, reading second wave feminism from the 60s and 70s uh, and uh, just really feel strongly that women are only capable of being good when they're with other women, basically. And men are just hmm. incapable. I've only ever seen TERFs on like Twitter and on the internet and stuff. Yeah, and most of them do study gender studies or have professors who have written books and material that is specifically anti-trans people. So it is kind of a self-sustaining, very isolated movement from my experience anyway. Yeah, I've only ever seen them online personally, never encountered them like, you know, yeah, out in the physical world. They are very radicalized at the moment, though, uh, and you like the professors that I know that are TERFs are very verbal about their concerns. And I think they genuinely think they're coming from a good place in this because they seem very uh, concerned the same way that in the 80s, parents were very concerned about homosexuals uh, violating uh, children. They seem concerned in that way about trans people, which is scary to me because uh, it, it's always it's almost always propagated by some people who have ulterior motives, and uh, I hope it goes away like the homophobia of the eighties did. Yeah, that uh, would be good. And we should also, um, I guess, differentiate turfs from just regular transphobes, mm -hmm. as well as transphobes who happen to be left wing, mm -hmm. because I feel like the term turf 
is thrown around a lot mm. and like hurled at people who don't necessarily fit that definition. I agree. Yeah. No. Yeah. Totally. The turf, uh, the, the actual turfs of this world are very few and far between, because the radical feminists who hate trans people is it's very specific, right? So yeah, uh, mm. uh, transphobes are way more common, but they don't share the radical feminism that turfs do. So I agree. We need yeah. to come up with a new term or something. Well, we could always call them um, instead of trans exclusionary radical feminists. We could simply call them feminist appropriating radical transphobes, or um, F A R T for short. I guess just to talk about transphobes in general, I guess firstly, what turns someone into a transphobe? Uh, I guess I'm I'm sort of especially I especially mean uh, transphobes on the left, mm. and what can we do about it? Because obviously. Um, the shit island's official stance is that transphobia is bad. Mm -hmm. It is bad indeed. I have a, a, a shot in the dark, if you will, but mm -hmm. I, I obviously don't know for sure. But I think a lot of, from what I've read, the especially Marxist and leftist criticism of trans people is that it seems like a, a, a decadent display of individualism or something like that. That it's, it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, I don't know. It's de degenerate might be a stance that they'll take that it's it's not uh, conducive to the revolution or some some mm. vague criticism that sounds kind of Marxist that doesn't really deal with the issue but just kind of uh, says that it's decadent and shouldn't happen in socialism basically I, I don't yeah. like it but that seems to be the reasoning. No, it's just liberalism. Ooh. That too, yeah. That it's that it's a, a, a something that only happens in liberal democracy or whatever, which it has been shown historically it isn't, and it is something that does happen, and has happened through history. Yeah, I mean there is um, evidence, obviously not, you know, clear cut evidence, but there is some evidence to show that gender before the agricultural revolution, so during the hunter gatherer period um wasn't really as stringent as it is today mm -hmm. and uh, there was talk about how trans people used to exist you know, during hunter-gatherer times because they found uh, male or masculine skeletons buried in female graves mm. together with like items and tools used by gatherers which would indicate that this was someone assigned male who lived as a female yeah, and that could be a trans woman, or it could just be a man who wanted to be a gatherer. Mm -hmm. But usually, the men were the hunters, and the women were the gatherers. And so, that fi that finding, it could be proof that trans people have always been a thing, or it could not be. Yeah, and we also have to be very wary of the way that we perceive history and the things that have come up as issues over time, because there has been a lot of um, uh, I guess what Gramsci would call like hegemony in like what we accept as valid history and what we sweep under the rug. If you go to the yeah. National Museum in London, you'll find the secret rooms where you can where you have to ask for permission to enter, which is all the quote unquote degenerate art that they found in third world countries that uh, deal with uh, sexuality and deal with. Um, uh, sex toys or whatever stuff that they found and, and, and brought home but couldn't publicly display. And they do, from what yeah. I've heard, display statues of uh, people that are both women and men. And you also see that in uh, Indi the Hinduism, you have gods, uh, I believe, that are yeah. men and women in one. So, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah like you said, gender is, you know, and, and has historically, there's been a lot of hints that, that, transsexuality is something that's been talked about at least and something that might have actually been mm -hmm. lived as well way back in the beginning of humanity too yeah in um in uh south america or um, is it i think it's in mexico but it's in the general latin american community among uh, the indigenous population there are oh what's the what's the term uh, i've forgotten it now uh two spirit ah uh, yes which is um, this like ancient thing, uh, but basically it's basically someone who's I think both male and female or neither, like just a non-binary 
uh, gender identity that has like existed for thousands of years. Interesting. I'm not familiar with it. I'm gonna Google it. Two Spirit is a Pan Indian umbrella term used by some indigenous North Americans to describe certain people in their community, their communities, who fulfill a traditional third gender or other gender variant ceremonial role in their cultures. Yeah, and you have um, communities in India as well, I believe, that also have um, third gender roles. Uh, and like even tribes who are made up almost entirely of, of third gender people. Um, yeah. yeah. Historically, uh, the presence of male-bodied two-spirits was a fundamental institution among most, most tribal peoples, according to Brian Gilley. And according to non-native anthropologist Will Roscoe, both male and female-bodied two-spirits have been documented in over 130 North American tribes in every region of the continent. Hmm. Obviously, the way that we perceive history is based on how we perceive society today. Mm. We see history through the lens of our current society and our current understanding of social norms. Mm. But obviously... <clears throat> ancient america had no contact with you know european society and their norms and ideas and traditions were completely new created by them mm -hmm. and so we can't really look at their societies through the lens of growing up in european society yeah because it's, it's not related so their understanding of, of gender and sex and identity was probably very different from what ours is today. Absolutely. And yeah, it again goes back to that thing of um, we choose to tell the story of the past that we choose to tell. So we will always mm -hmm. highlight the stuff that gels with how we perceive reality or the story of our civilization that we want to tell. And some things kind of fall out of that perimeter. Um, I highly recommend uh, Michel Foucault's book, um, uh, The History of Madness, I think it's called or Madness and Civilization, I can't remember. I think it was, it was given multiple uh, titles when it was translated. But in it, he talks about how a lot of the time, if you read history, it's written in a language where we perceive history to be a constant march of progress because it's written that way. Yeah. It's written in a way where we are progressively and constantly getting smarter and better and technology is improving and we treat people better and people live better lives for each generation. And we don't really question it because it just seems logical to us as people who are alive right now that we are living in the best time possible. And he says every generation mm. has felt that way and we don't really notice how some things actually are worse today than they were 50 years ago because we have this installed setting in our brain that things have never been better. But um, yeah. he, he made some, I think, valid arguments that people who are uh, suffering from some kind of mental illness actually had better lives a hundred years ago or, or longer ago. And the same could be said for trans people. Um, in history, in a lot of places, they were treated a lot better and less publicly um, uh, observed and stared at and judged than they are today. So, yeah, yeah. I highly recommend um, that book by, by Foucault, um, um, Madness and Civilization, I think it's called. I mean, the, the same can be said for homosexual men specifically mm -hmm. but i think homosexual women as well or um not homosexual specifically just um uh not really having a sexuality soul and just being like free i guess because mm -hmm. in both ancient greece and ancient rome you know having sex with the same gender was not seen as weird in fact it was pretty much the norm hmm. and for men i believe it was sort of a masculine thing to have sex with another masculine man and because it was like a dominance thing mm. and that was just part of the culture it wasn't like some people are gay and some people are straight it was just like sometimes i want to fuck men yeah that's not a thing that, that doesn't have a word that's just the way it is mm -hmm. yeah we went from that to like hey no homo bro <laughs> yeah and a lot of it does come from or at least seemingly comes from religious tenets and morality about um, yeah. what, uh, like lying with a spouse, what does that mean? And um, procreation. And um, I guess also like just uh, the, the Protestant way of, <laughs> it sounds very, very German idealism me to say, but like the Protestant <laughs> way of, of orchestrating a capitalist society, 
but it's like uh, the, you and your Max Weber. Yeah, like the Protestant um, Adam family. What's that called? Atomic family. Uh, nuclear, nuclear family. Nuclear family. Nuclear family. That's what's called. Yeah. Yeah. The nuclear family, where you, if you combine your incomes, you can buy a house and a car and blah blah blah. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we truly are talking about history. <laughs> <laughs> I was just about to say, yeah, no, not today, no. Yeah. If you combine your incomes, you can maybe buy an apartment and like a Vespa. You can get a two a two bedroom, <laughs> and uh, maybe if you save for a while, you can get an electronic bike. Like one of those yeah. bikes with Even that's batteries. a bit of a pipe dream. Yeah, it is. It is. <laughs> those batteries aren't cheap. Yeah, I know. I know. My dad has an, an electronic bike. It's it's pretty radical. Like, it's... I, I can't believe I just said radical and ironic. <laughs> it's cool. <laughs> it's pretty dab. It's pretty, it's, it's pretty yeet. It's pretty yeet, uh, y'all. If I'm going to be 100 with you, fam. <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, it's like a, it's kind of like a moped, um, cause it has like, um, you can adjust like how much the engine actually moves you forward. Oh. And if you put it all the way up, you basically don't have to actually, you know, bike at all. Yeah. You can just sit and it goes. One of my ex-girlfriend's fathers was one of the first people to sell those bikes in Denmark. And, uh, there wasn't any regulation at the time when they first came into the market. I remember, and then he would just buy these from Thailand and China or wherever and sell them. And they, so, so they would be all just like hazardous to your health because they would radically vary in how f- efficient they were. And I would always try them and always just hope that, that they worked <laughs> and that they wouldn't just throw me off. I remember one, I sat down and turned the, uh, the battery all the way up. And as soon as I pedaled a little, it just went like... I want to say like 40 kilometers an hour just straight ahead and I, I felt like I felt like I was in a back to the future movie or something and I was just being thrown out into space and it was awesome oh that does sound cool so get yourself an unsafe bike y'all electric scooters are a thing mm-hmm. that have been in the news recently they've been banned in a bunch of places like in Madrid they're just illegal to have now um, because apparently what like there were there there've been like renting services for electric scooters and i guess the pro- main problem has been like people rent them and then drive to somewhere and then just kind of throw it on the ground uh, or like on the pavement just like haywire uh, because there's nowhere to park them and so they're just fucking everywhere and people are like walking and tripping over them all the time uh, and so madrid was like fuck this no you can't have them <laughs> Like, it, it was nothing about, like, safety or anything. It was just like, no, fucking huh. stop leaving these things all... Stop being an annoying dick. <laughs> but also, a lot of people are riding them without helmets and uh, getting into accidents and, you know, getting their heads crushed. Which is a bad That's thing. That's just Darwinism at work. Come on. <laughs> Wear your Ex- helmets, people. Explain that, Bernie Sanders. <laughs> Uh, we're going to talk about Bernie Sanders uh, later on. in the Yes, episode. no spoilers. Yeah, yeah. I was just, uh, this, that's what they call uh, foreshadowing. So, hosting a podcast is hard work. We, um, we do a lot. We work many hours a day on this, on this show. Um, probably, probably like 16 hours a day, every day, I would say. Uh, we work on planning the show for you guys. Um... And, uh, you know, it's not free to do it either. Um, we have to host it somewhere and, you know, we have a very professional recording equipment that we bought uh, with our own money, you know, headphones and microphones and uh, new mm-hmm. computers to handle the recording and um, private jets so that we could all fly to the same recording location. And we bought our own recording studio. I don't know why, but but Asher insisted that it would be the same recording studio that uh, Kanye West did My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy in, so it's really expensive. <laughs> it's very special to me. Well worth the money, I think. Yeah. Um, so because of all of our expenses, um, this episode of Shit Island is brought to you by the Shit Island Patriot Blend 100% Organic GMO-Free Estrogen Pills mm. for patriotic American girls with big girly dicks and an even bigger love for our country. Sign up now for a free copy of Undoing Gender by Judith Butler. Great, really it's beautiful. Great pills. I mean, you can taste the patriotism in them. I mean, just yeah. uh, that's what um, I've heard. Yeah, you can you can really taste the patriotism. You can. It's really good. The just the best thing about them is that they're a hundred percent organic and GMO free. 
Uh, mm-hmm. So they're grown by uh, South American slaves in uh, Bolivia, mm-hmm. and um, they're paid in estrogen. Yes. Um, and uh, you know they harvest them for twenty hours a day, put them in a big box, and it's shipped to America where uh, it's processed into estrogen pills. And as we all know, they do use estrogen as a currency down there, so it's not exploitation, really, when you think about it. Yeah, and I mean, we they all sign contracts. All of them, yeah. So it's, it's good. Uh, even the children, the the uh, the the ones who didn't know how to write, they just would just sort of put their hand in ink and then put the the hand on the paper. So that that's kind of a signature. So that counts. And it's so cute. You should see them. Those little kids just pawing yeah. away at the contracts. It's like cats. It's so cute. Yeah. That is very cute. Uh, yeah. It's very voluntary, very patriotic. Uh, oh, yeah. Business. Uh, yeah, don't worry about it. Yeah, I should know that after I started taking them, I did notice this side effect when I suddenly started caring about what the Constitution says. So just, just be aware <laughs> of that. Just make sure that you read your Judith Butler book as you're taking them. Just a few times and you should be safe. Yeah. Judith Butler, um, well-known patriot, loved her country. Absolutely, yeah. Very, um, very, very, you know, uh, there's a lot of traditional values, yeah. um, very upstanding citizen, just plugging along for the country that she's from. Yeah. It's beautiful. Uh, staunch um, GOP supporter. Oh, yeah, yeah. She, I believe she campaigned for um, that lady in, uh, who, what was it, uh, where Cinema won in Arizona, I think, yeah, that uh, Trump lady. She was very. She cares a lot about the wall. And, I have no uh, idea who you're talking about. Yeah, I'm starting to question. What was her name again? There was a lady in in <clears throat> the senator lady, the only one that the Democrats picked up in twenty in the midterms. Oh God, Cinema was the one that won. Uh, I'm just googling it now. Kir- Kirsten Cinema. Who was she up against? She was up against some other lady who was very. Oh, Martha McSally. Yes. Yeah. That was that was the the joke. I was I was <laughs> very uh, <laughs> very relatable. Very you know, it's it's one of those Jerry Seinfeld jokes that everyone got. Everyone understood immediately yep. the reference yep. I was going for. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> quality programming here, people. You know you've made a you know you know you've made a good joke when you have to Google your own joke halfway through <laughs> to know what you're talking about. Um, get your own. Uh, shit Island Patriot <laughs> Blend 100% organic GMO free oh. estrogen pills at www.shitisland.bigmilk.gov forward slash geocities.com Consume now! Uh, enter promo code Donald Trump 2020 for uh, 15% off. We should we should talk to who was it that owned Geocities? Was it Yahoo? We should talk to them about if we could buy the domain name <laughs> geocities.com <laughs> I don't think it's for sale. And I think if it was, we would not be able to afford it. (laughs) Maybe big tech companies do the equivalent of like a yard sale from time to time to unload bad trademarks or unload like (laughs) things that don't have any value anymore. Just like the whole AOL Warner thing. Maybe they just have space in the filing cabinet. Yeah, taking up space in the hard drives and the filing stuff. They must file for renewal of those copyright things every five years or two years or whatever. Like, that must be oh, annoying. Yeah. Maybe they do. They must have millions of trademarks, like GeoCities, that just are dead and gone, and no one remembers <laughs> them. Yeah, probably. It would be so fun if we could get GeoCities for, like, $20. <laughs> I sincerely doubt it. Yeah. I, I put in $20 for it. Me too. Uh, we got some emails, you guys. Surprisingly enough, you you people have actually been sending us emails. I'm amazed. <laughs> I mean, we remind them to send in emails like every well, ten yeah. minutes. Well, so. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I've never seen these emails. The goat just keeps saying that we have emails. I've never seen them. But I'll just take the goat's oh, word for I'm, it. I'm I'm the one with the password to the to the email account. People have been talking to me about this email and asking if it's real. So I think we might have overly. I think a lot of people didn't know it existed and just thought we made up the email like we make up the websites on the <laughs> no. spot. <laughs> no, it's a real email address. You can actually... The websites are also it. real. No. <laughs> <laughs> Type it out. See what happens. Now you don't know what to believe, listener. Uh, okay, so uh, Gaetano sent us an email and he says, Hi, I just had a chance to watch episode one of your podcast and I absolutely loved it. It was an interesting conversation filled with wit and insight. 
A Aww. topic I would really like for you to discuss next time is Marxist analysis of sex work. I would like to hear your thoughts on it since I've heard a range of different views on the subject. Thank you. That is a great topic. And I agree. We should <laughs> definitely is. cover that at some point. Yes. And I don't know will. why I'm turning into Jack Kennedy. Why are you doing that? Era, uh, yes, geez. I agree. It is a very serious topic. Um, to answer your question, uh, listener, yes, we will to- uh, cover that topic eventually. But uh, actually, I've fucking like a madman. I fucking went out and bought a book to, you know, read so I can cover it better on the show. It's yeah. uh, Meat Market by uh, Laurie Penny. I believe that's her name, yeah. Yes. So after we've read that, and then, you know, we're going to get into the sex industry ourselves to, you know, get a first hand working <laughs> experience, you know. Um, Peter is going to be my pimp for a while. I'm going to see mm-hmm. how that works and get all the ins and outs of the industry. And, you know, then we're going to have a full in depth discussion uh, on the show. And hopefully make a few bucks while we're at it. That would be good. Yeah. On a slightly different note, though, we uh, are uh, planning on having guests on eventually. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, we, we wanted to do a, f- a few more episodes first before we invited guests on to you know, give them a sense of what exactly Shit Island is and what they're getting into. Yeah. yeah. No, I, yeah, absolutely. I think it would be a lot of fun to have guests on um, and to, you know, bring in some people who might disagree with us a little or that we admire. And just uh, spread the shit and love. Right now on the guest list are uh, Richard Wolf, David Harvey, uh, Slavoj Zizek, Jordan B. Peterson, Ben Shapiro, uh, mm-hmm. Sargon of Akkad, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The mm-hmm. Kanye West. Steve Harvey. Actually, I also want to get on Jay Rule to talk about the Fire Festival, because I just saw the documentary and it was pretty interesting. Um, Donald Trump, um, Bernie Sanders. Yeah. Judith Butler. Um, the Pope. Michael Jackson. Mm-hmm. He's not dead. No, he's alive. Uh, I saw him. Vladimir Putin. Tupac. Tupac's still alive mm-hmm. as well. Uh, Elvis. No, he's dead. <laughs> no, he lives he, he lives just down the street from me. It's true, he's still alive. Yeah. yeah. Notorious B.I.G. Biggie. Biggie Smalls. Um, Killer Mike. Uh, Rick and Morty. Both yep. of them. Yeah. The, not the creators of the show, the actual characters. Yeah, we we want Justin Justin Roiland to come on and do the voices, and we talk with the characters. Uh, I think that's the guest list so far. Also, Bad Mass, I think. Oh yeah, Bad Mass. Oh, well. mm-hmm. That would be cool. Yeah, I just watched uh, a few of his videos today. He's he uh, he he makes he's he's very good rhetorically. I I like him a lot. Hmm. Yeah. If you want to send us an email, you can do so at Shit Island Show at gmail.com and that's an that's real email address it's not a joke it's not a bit that it's is an a actual real email address you can send us whatever you want shit island show at gmail.com yeah so moving on to the next topic uh libs love em. libs and dems and sock dems Ooh. um when you are in a situation when you live in a country where the biggest political party is either liberal or social democratic, or or rather the biggest left wing party, is either liberal or social democratic, and there isn't a good alternative that has any realistic chance of winning in liberal elections. Should we support the lesser of two evils in those cases, or should we agitate and be members of smaller parties that are mm. more aligned with our views? That's a heavy topic, and. Um, I think most we we're mostly thinking about this from an American perspective, because we all live in countries where there are left wing alternatives to the Social Democrats. I'm kind of I think I'm kind of pragmatic when it comes to it. I think it's possible to support a Bernie type and still critique, like support them critically. Uh, in social democratic countries or social liberal countries, um, I think it's possible to do some fire prevention in in like uh, service of a democratic party who will still recognize you as a human being and not take away your rights if you're a trans person or a homosexual, and still agitate for a better alternative, a better like honestly good leftist alternative, um, which I see anyway as being like 
disconnected from the election cycle and something that happens every day and something that you need to agitate for every day in 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 like volunteer work or political organizing or unionizing or whatever so i don't see it as i mean it does legitimize the current political system if you vote but you also could look at it from just a fire prevention point of view whereas if you like like just from a a moral point of view where if you don't vote for someone who isn't donald trump then you know you <laughs> your friends and and comrades are going to have their rights taken away and it's going to be incrementally harder to organize anything uh that is more uh leftist than what you have now i don't know i think it's very complex and it's not an easy answer to unless you want to go fully dogmatic and just go no boycott all elections everything is bourgeoisie propaganda blah 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 yeah, that's a stance I very much disagree with, uh, just boycotting the elections. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think we all recognize that socialism, uh, especially in America, won't come from just putting a piece of paper in a ballot box every four years. Mm. No. Um, that's a very unrealistic expectation. And if socialism is something that you want, then, like Peter said, it is something that you have to agitate for and organize mm. for you have to unionize and and i mean i would suggest joining um a party like um party for socialism and liberation uh not because they have any chance in hell at winning anything other than you know mayor's offices and you know regional elections but because mm. they are a group of like-minded people that you know they give they have a platform and and people who listen to them and uh if you can help promote them then that will help promote your ideals yeah and and also i think a lot of the time sorry to interrupt just really quickly a lot of the time in the u.s in as a republic you find that um the higher you get up in the system the less power you actually have to make a difference so someone like a local council member actually has a lot of power politically in in the area that you live in whereas the president has um more the, the higher you get up the more and more people you have to report to basically so if yeah. you have a socialist group that you're a member of you can you can actually you can run someone who is a socialist to the local council and have that person actually agitate for and bring up all these issues locally and help change your local community as the first thing you do and then you can yeah. move on from there so it is it is i think it is possible to make a difference locally if not through some um socialist party like as you mentioned then through the democrats run someone who oh, yeah. is more in line with your uh, with your opinions locally so yeah. just like in your county yeah, run someone yeah. against the establishment Democrat who actually embodies what you believe, or run yourself, run for office. Try, why not? Yeah, I just want to say that, like on a very local level of like these uh, places where you know Democrat Party is active, like the people are active in it. That's like three, four people. Like show up with just mm -hmm. your friends, and you can basically just take over that local chapter of Democrat Party. Just oh yeah, by showing and up with like four people because. These are small groups, sometimes very small. You can very Tiny. easily take it over just with like a few friends. And the Democrats would never see it coming if it was just in a tiny little seat in Wyoming or in, uh, I don't know, Texas. Uh, they would never see it coming if you actually ran a friend of yours or yourself against the established person who's been there for 40 years or whatever. They'll just assume that people don't care enough and they don't want to run, so they'll just mindlessly run this guy again and it is actually possible and it has been seen before that people have come in and shocked everyone and just taken a seat oh, locally yeah. and yeah and in republics like america it is possible and a lot of the big decisions which deal with social issues moral issues locally are dealt with in city councils and are dealt with in state senates they're not really dealt with from the president's office um, look at someone like trump and see how much He's struggling to implement anything, really, because every time he makes some kind of big uh, proposal of a law or amendment or change to something in the military, it gets struck down by some Supreme Court in Hawaii or California or something, and he just can't do it. So his wiggle room is very limited, but that, that, same, that same limitation isn't there as much in state councils or in county councils, uh, city councils. So it's uh, th I think that would be a good way of of 
actually doing something and actually having an impact on your local society and on, on like America in general. Yeah, there's a lot of power at the local level, which is very easy to pick up if you just tried. Yeah. Um, speaking of Trump, do you guys think that he will actually be charged with anything before his term is out? I don't think before, but I think if he leaves office, they'll probably charge him. I don't think they'll charge him while he's still in there because that's a whole constitutional mess which they probably don't want to open. Yeah, that's a great question. I don't know if they have anything on him, like if they can pin anything down to him, because it seems like um, he his whole the whole organization of his campaign was done in a way so that he could blame others for his actions. Yeah, so I but some of those others you, have yeah. said that they were specifically directed by him to you know, do these actions, which is kind of illegal. Only, yeah, but but at the same time, they haven't been able to nail Trump down for any of these things, even when people claim that they were given to him. Because at that point, if they don't have it in writing or they don't have a direct order, it's coming through someone else. So I think we could very easily be in a situation in 2020 uh, where like 90% of the people who worked on Trump's campaign are in prison and Donald Trump walks free because he didn't technically give any orders in like a direct form so they can't nail him down for it. And at the same time, I don't think most Republicans care if oh, no, Trump don't. cheated or not. They don't, so they'll no. still vote for him. So, I mean, I... I Unless they find some very smoky gun somewhere on on Trump, I don't think there's going to be any um, any uh, repercussions for him. Uh, not while he's president or after, because he seems to have done a very good job of building the organization so that everyone but him would go to prison. I mean, I was very surprised when they actually managed to get Roger Stone. Yeah, I was. Me too. I've been surprised they've managed to get anyone so far. I did not expect anything to ever come from this, but they've managed to get a few people, which. I honestly thought Roger Stone would be like the last person they would ever get, but me too. They got him. Yeah, I was very surprised that they got him. Um, but again, it just kind of, I think, for me anyway, proved um, that they've done it in a way so that everyone else is culpable but him. Yeah, so, yeah. But I was very happy to see Roger Stone go to prison. That was very that was yeah. satisfying. Very satisfying, yeah. So, yeah, man, uh, hopefully. President Sanders will uh, be able to throw uh, Trump in prison. <laughs> I really, I really hope they nominate Bernie Sanders just because I want to see Sanders and Trump debate. That would oh, be amazing. I want to see that so much. That would be great. Yeah. <laughs> Did you see that thing he said about Howie Schultz? Oh, no, but I want to see that. Yes, I want to see that now. Someone asked uh, Bernie Sanders about Howard Schultz, who is the former CEO of Starbucks, who said like he's doing an independent run as president. Uh, if if the Democrats don't nominate some centrist, that's his threat to, to the, the outliers in the Democratic Party. So they asked Bernie Sanders about it. And they, said, they said something like, Howard Schultz is saying unless the Democrats nominate a centrist, he's going to run for president. And Bernie Sanders' response was, oh, isn't that nice? Oh, wonderful. Oh, that's so <laughs> nice of him to, to intervene in this. You know why you're listening to him? Because he's a billionaire. And that's all he said. Yeah, and it was so badass. True. And I loved it. And he's right. <laughs> Beautiful. Dude, an independent can never win president no he's no he can fuck up someone else's chances exactly for president. yes he can siphon votes off yeah and he but on even then i think an independent candidate would be would not siphon off that many votes but he would no, he would appeal to democratic voters that's the thing uh, that's he, the thing yeah. like if we take say um the last uh cycle like i mean hillary barely lost and basically any one factor that was changed and maybe she would have won so you know let's say the green party hadn't been as you know uh, aggressive or whatever maybe that would have tipped her over or... i mean she did win well yeah but like in these few states which you know, she had to win like th those few like half a percentage maybe if that can tip things if things are already that close but again, like, that's a discussion you often have in American politics, where it is, uh, are the, 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 is the Green Party just a, a giant uh, spoil sport for the Democrats? And I, I don't think you can look at, at, look at it that way, because I think a lot of Green Party voters wouldn't vote if the Green Party wasn't around, and they just wouldn't participate. Probably. So uh, I, don't, I think they I don't do know. have a bit of that effect, though. I think they do 
Oh yeah, if but, not um, pull the wave votes, I think they make certain people stay <laughs> at home rather than actually participating in politics. Yeah, but on the other side, you have the Libertarian Party, which receives approximately as many votes as the Green Party does. So it seems to kind of even out. Like the the people yeah, who are yeah, that's a fair point. Yeah, that's the people who are a little further left usually vote for the Green Party, and the people who are a little further right economically vote for Libertarians. So it does. For, I don't know. I don't. I guess uh, that's hmm. true. Yeah. Another argument about uh, smaller parties that I've heard, uh, specifically in the UK, about the the British uh, Green Party, and because some people say, well, why would you vote for the Green Party when you could vote for Labour? When you're voting for the Greens, you're taking votes away from Labour. Mm. And the argument that's given is that the more votes that the Green Party gets, the more Labour will think, well, how can we get those voters back? How can we appeal to those guys who vote green? Mm. And so Labour will adapt um, Green Party policies and, you know, do more stuff that the Green Party wants to do to get those voters back. And so if a lot of people vote for the Green Party in the US, maybe the Democratic Party will think, well, we want those votes. What can we do to appeal to Green Party voters? I mean, they should. I get that argument. (laughs) From me, though... If I if I was you know, like you know somewhere you know in the leadership of like Labour or like uh, Democratic Party, if I was looking at you no know, these other parties, like I'd be like, hey, how can we steal away votes from like the Republicans or you no know, the Tories or Conservatives, whatever they're called? Like, I'm not going to be like, hey, this tiny party which no one votes for, how can we appeal to those voters as opposed to this massive other party which is our main opponent? Well, yeah, but like then you have to be like a nationalist and stuff but that's yeah that's what i was going to say is historically uh parties like labor and the democrats never veer left they always veer center because they do look at it the way you said jules where it's how do we get people from the republicans or from the tories to vote for our party instead of this tiny tiny little amount of people on the left and i think it does when you look at it the way where you say uh, okay, how many people voted for uh, the SNP or for um, the Greens or whatever, and then they you measure the left wing by that? I think that's dangerous because it does give that impression that if they veer left, they only gain X amount of people who are currently voting for the slightly more left wing party. It doesn't give the impression that it might actually appeal to people um, who are just not voting or people who are voting for the conservatives because they they think they're going to do one thing and not realize that they're getting another thing. I think a charismatic socialist would be very popular, but I think a lot of these established... Yeah, yeah, and even even like real socialists would be very appealing to people. I just think a lot of these established traditional parties are too afraid because they think that they're going to just be beaten massively. And I get the 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 impression that a lot of these centrists, old centrists, are kind of ashamed of their party's roots and don't want to 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 go back to how they were because they think that they're going to be exposed for some reason, or they think that what they believe in might actually not work so they don't have faith in their own project and that's yeah. very problematic i think uh i mean the entire new labor thing with tony blair was really just a way to get tory voters to vote yeah. labor yeah and we i mean we know how that worked out yeah turned labor into a centrist neoliberal party basically oh that's definitely basically yeah. also what how hillary fucked up you know she really wants to get those moderate republicans they they're Republicans, yeah. they, they weren't going to go for it anyway, so it's just, it was a pointless exercise. But uh... Yeah, and mm-hmm. that's, that's, there's, been, there's been a lot of great books written about Tony Blair's ascendancy to the leadership and how he embraced Thatcher and all that. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's a very, be, be, like, beat your enemy by becoming your enemy is something that uh, social Democrats have been doing for 100 years now or something, just slowly adapting the optics and uh, reality of whatever the current currently ruling party takes on and just hope that people will vote for you instead because you're more charismatic or because you um have historic ties to unions or whatever like it's it's when you do that you're not really giving any alternative you're just going entirely on optics and i think that's what the social democrats are doing in denmark that's what they were doing before corbyn in the uk 
And um, I think Zizek had a great point when he said that social democracy is like the European conservatism, because it is really just very traditionalistic and very don't change anything, just leave it as is. And uh, you do become this vanguard of the status quo if you're a social democrat yeah. in Europe anyway. That is um, the social democrats in Sweden are, are doing that right now. Mm -hmm. um, We've talked um, earlier about the January agreement with the, uh, uh, the between the Social Democrats and the Libertarian parties, the centrists and the liberals. The infamous agreement, yeah. How's that going, by the way? Um, I mean, so far, I think one of the policies has started to be implemented, which is the high-speed rail, um, which is, I mean, the construction is in the early phases of um, being a thing I think that's the only part of the agreement that's been enacted on I think everything else is just on the hold for now high speed rail sounds nice though yeah um, I, I like the main problem with it is that the the agreement also calls for lowering the taxes on anything and everything and so the state is not going to have the money to build the high speed rail Oh, yeah that doesn't Ouch. sound nice yeah I mean, the the entire agreement basically is just a mismatch of spend a lot more money, but also lower all taxes hmm. and we and provide no alternatives for, you know, getting more money to the state. Anyway, um, the Social Democrats have been moving further to the right basically since um, the 70s, 80s. Yeah. Uh, I mean, slowly but surely, especially after 1991, after the fall of the Eastern Bloc. Mm. Um, they've just been moving towards neoliberalism and I, I guess as you said European um, conservatism mm. you know wanting to preserve the European Union and all that comes with it and uh, not really pushing for any major reforms just kind of wanting to keep things the way they are yeah I think so yeah I, I think that makes sense and I think a lot of the prejudice that people in Europe has against leftist causes comes from prejudice against social democratic um uh what do you want to call it like um um douchebaggery <laughs> yeah but also like cowardice i think i want to call it social democratic cowardice because every time it seems mm -hmm. like you challenge a social democrat on any proposal they kind of wince a little i don't know if you have that in sweden too but they kind of wince and almost like apologize for what they believe in and there's no real like there's no there's no real heart to the democratic message and the social democratic message anymore i think i think it's all kind of said mm. like uh like yeah i guess like the state is kind of good i guess like they're not they're not wholeheartedly in this <laughs> project anymore they're just kind of uh, slugging yeah. along and like saying let's hire a few more nurses i guess like it doesn't seem like they have any <laughs> any like game plan for what they want society to be like they're just kind of of defending against new ideas and that's that's not a great place to come from politically i think yeah i think the social democrats in sweden are more um i mean their rhetoric is left ish and you know they, they talk about how they want all these great things and they want sweden to be great and have a great social security net and great welfare and then they don't implement that yeah and then they work with the the libertarian parties that want to lower all the taxes and dismantle all the welfare mm. and, or, you know so it's like they essentially say one thing and do another oh it's the same here yeah absolutely and people don't trust the social democrats here anymore uh and for good yeah. reason because every time they run they say one thing and then when they get into office they just lower taxes and sell off nationalized uh yes. institutions to highest bidders from america usually mm -hmm. and it just it rings very hollow and like the you just get this eroded trust in them and in uh, polit politics in general i guess and it just it reflects very poorly on every political party because the social democrats are kind yeah. of held here as the moral standard i think like whenever there's any and en whenever any political party says anything they always call up the social democrats and say okay so what do you think about this and the social democrats most of the time just say no comment because they just they're too afraid to say anything <laughs> like they'll just they'll just say no comment to everything and guess who's there to always give a comment is the danish people's party they're always willing to say something half-hearted and stupid because it, they, it'll get them in the, the newspapers so they kind of they're leaving this power vacuum and not really wholeheartedly 
uh, taking up this mantle of like forwarding society. It's just this very conservative and cowardice driven way of leading society, I think. Anyway. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There was recently there was a, a group within the Social Democratic Party in Sweden which is called the Reformists, mm-hmm. which uh, is basically a group of social democrats who want to bring the social democratic party back to its more radical social democratic roots cool um but th- what most people are asking is why don't these people just leave and join the left party mm. because basically everything that the reformists advocate for is what the left party advocates for i see so the reformists basically want to turn the social democrats into the left party hmm but yeah, it's an attempt to turn the social democrats uh, back towards the left, but I don't think it's going to be especially successful. Yeah, and then it's it's interesting you see these and and varying degrees of success in these splinter groups internally in the in the party. Um, what's that new thing that's happening in Labour in the UK? The uh, the new group, independent group. That's the oh, one. Yeah. those people. Yeah, yeah. The the uh, new new Labour people who are jumping out of the Labour Party and uniting with some conservatives against Brexit, I think, or something like that. Yeah, you do see a lot of that internal pressure kind of boiling over at the moment. Um, And I I don't know Mm. what to think of it, because on one hand, I think it can be a force of good. Like if, if say, that those social democrats in Sweden had some kind of impact on the social democrats and brought on a new election, maybe that would be for the best and the social democrats could get back to more social democratic roots instead of neoliberal uh, status quo, then that might be good. But also I could see it kind of going the very other direction too, like in the Tea Party in in the US that kind of killed off all the sane Republicans, if you want to use that term. So I don't know, it seems, yeah, no uh, critical support, I guess, for splinter groups. (laughs) (laughs) yeah um it's interesting when it happens but i mean it's good when people don't just sit silently yeah um but rather stand up for what they believe in and make it public what they believe in that is so uh, you know yeah hopefully the social democrats will move back toward the left i don't exactly have high hopes that that will happen Mm. um i mean i'm sort of placing all my chips on the left party at the moment me too yeah me too um there's just been i just read the newspaper today uh and uh there is a a recent move in in the danish left parties i think there's three or four parties that are left of the social democrats in parliament in denmark and they they've come together now to demand answers from the social democrats because there's an election that's bound to happen in denmark by june by the latest i think then it's been four years since our last election so we do have a summer election for parliament coming up and they they're bound to, they're, they're kind of they're going together now to to demand answers from the social democrats about what it is they'll actually do if they win the the election because the social democrats haven't said anything besides we need a thousand more nurses so what happened the last time that the social democrats run the social democrats said we're going to do this for the elderly and we're going to do this for students and we're going to do this and then as soon as they got into power they started lowering taxes and selling off nationalized properties and industries so they didn't do anything of what they said and just let this very neoliberal agenda uh to the anger of everyone and they lost tremendously the next election and this time they're not even saying anything they're just saying a thousand more nurses and they're they're refusing to comment on the story even and they're not uh they're not answering any journalists calling up saying so what do you actually believe or what do you want and even even though all the left parties in denmark have united and said what do you want to do if you win the election the social democrats aren't saying anything and they're not commenting on the story uh, so it's it's a big it's a big thing, and like I think a lot of people really want a left wing government, but they just don't like the social democrats at all, and that's pretty scary. It's interesting also to come across people who say, like you said, people who want a left wing government, but they don't like the social democratic party, right? But they also don't want to vote for the left party. Yeah, there's a lot because of because the left party is too extreme. Yeah. 
that it's it does seem like the social democrats historically have been like an entry point for quote unquote regular people to vote for the left wing because it's not as it's not seen as as radical to vote for the social democrats as the left party or whatever other party and now they're just not really leftist at all so yeah, yeah no one's just, just no one's voting for the left wing now anymore um all of this talk about social democrats uh, has got me pretty bummed out me too so I think it's time for my humanity is good corner. Ah. So this week, I have a story about education. In the United States, since 1987, no more than 6% of medical students each year have come from families with poverty level incomes. Meanwhile, the cost of medical school has skyrocketed. The median student debt for the class of 2016 was $190,000. In the countryside of Western Havana, there's a school called the Latin American School of Medicine. The school is arguably the largest medical school in the world, with approximately 19,500 students enrolled. Tuition, meals, housing, uniforms, and monthly supplies are free, and the school provides a modest allowance each month. And here's the kicker. The school is an internationalist school. All those enrolled are international students from outside Cuba, mainly from Latin America and the Caribbean, as well as Africa and Asia, and even some people from the United States. And compared to in the US, where black and Latino students represent approximately 6% of medical school, medical school graduates each year, about half of the students from the US at the Latin American School of Medicine are black, and a third are Latino. The school was established in 1999 after a series of natural disasters left people in Central America and the Caribbean in dire need of health care. The school's mission is to recruit students from low-income marginalized community uh, where they are encouraged to return after they graduate to practice medicine. That is a very good story. And that is a very, <laughs> that's, that's very uplifting. And I had no clue that it existed before you, you mentioned it. And uh, yeah, no, it's just awesome because you, you, there are so many things syst systemically wrong with education in Europe and America where you see that people who come from working class families just don't go to university or don't choose higher yeah. education at all because it's just not in their social capital or they don't have the support for it or they don't uh, have the money for it which is a big yeah. thing these days even in social democratic countries so yeah i mean it's wonderful to see that a state like cuba is doing this kind of outreach even though they absolutely have no responsibility to do so <clears throat> i mean especially in the us i mean you if you are from a low-income family uh, you just don't have the money to go to college and you can maybe get a loan and have student debt for the rest of your life but that's not fun either because there's interest fees mm. and that's going to impact you forever oh yeah for most people a good college or a good university is not an mm. attainable goal I, no matter how well you do most most of those um um tuition uh what are those called um packages you can get um grants what are they called scholarships that's the name yes scholarships they don't cover all of the cost anyway so they cover maybe half or 60 percent and it's still highly like unattainable for most people who don't come from some kind of wealth so yeah it's it's a huge Even issue in um, um like you said in social democratic countries where university is free um there's still the cost of living that you have to worry about because while you're at university, um, often you can't work, at least not full time. You can maybe work weekends if you squeeze in some time, but depending on what you're studying, you might not mm. have the time to work weekends. Yeah, and that you're still expected to, um, basically. to like I'm, I'm racking up debt at the moment. Yeah. I am just... I, but it's very expensive to live anywhere close to a university in social democratic country, anywhere, I guess, like in the world. Um, and you just, uh, it's just a period of, of your life where you're just expected to rack up debt, yeah. basically, at this point. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's a big bummer. And people aren't happy, but what are you going to do? And the story is somewhere really annoys him because you know like over here like our government you know uh, making cuts like education one on one we can't afford this like motherfuckers cuba can afford this somehow we're way richer than cuba they can afford to fucking educate people why the fuck can't we yeah uh, we're way richer than cuba what the fuck it's 
it's all about priorities. Yeah, like, what do you so prioritize more? We don't more? want to pay for it because it costs money, and we have fucking you know multinational corporations we don't want to tax. Okay, I mean, let's be honest here. We do have the fucking money for this. We just don't want to spend it on this. We want to spend it on Shell and whoever else. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that's what they're saying when they're saying like you're lazy or we can't afford this is you know we we can afford it but we're choosing to spend the money magically hoping that if we give tax cuts to the richest companies in the country that they're going to stay in the country and not go to another country um which has uh, like different advantages to give tax cuts or whatever. It's it's all magical thinking and it's very condescending and I hate it. Yeah. God, I was thinking about something. Was it about uh, debt and being a student in Sweden? Uh, your your current I, I living was just situation. I talk about Cuba for a while, which is just something that I do. <laughs> ah, well, I mean, go for That's it. An impressive place. Yeah, I mean, um, Cuba has basically since the the revolution ended spent uh, a lot of time, effort, and capital on education. Um, it's something that they've invested a lot into. And, uh, I mean, it is money that they've sort of made back because uh, when a country spends money on education, it's an investment because those educated people will contribute a lot to the economy in the future when they've grown up a lot more than uneducated people will. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, uh, it, it, it's funny to say, but honestly, at this point, exporting doctors to Latin American countries, or I guess just South and Central American countries in general, is uh, one of the main sources of revenue for Cuba. Mm -hmm. They just have so many goddamn doctors that they don't need them all. And so they just send them off to countries where they're needed. Um, and part of the, the wages that the doctors get are paid to the government, like a tax. Um, like in uh, Brazil recently, um, a lot of there were a lot of Cuban doctors in Brazil who... Uh, were ordered to come home after the election of Bolsonaro. Didn't Bolsonaro basically also kick them out? I think he he like insulted Cuban doctors and said that the, the Cuban doctors were like slaves of the Cuban government and stuff. Yeah, uh, I think it was like some diplomatic shenanigans uh, with him and Cuba, which, you know, had forced basically the doctors as well to leave because they, I don't know, broke some treats or whatever. I don't know what it was anymore. Yeah. I mean... But yeah, it's going to leave a bunch of communities there now without any doctors because yeah. that was done by the Cubans. A lot of communities in uh, in South America rely on Cuban doctors because they just don't have any themselves. Because, I mean, usually in, in South American countries have one big university in the capital city and, you know, some people become doctors, sure, and most of them stay in the capital city where they can make money because um, you don't earn a lot of money as a doctor living, you know, at a, in a tiny remote village in the middle of nowhere. Mm. Um, when you become a doctor in Cuba, however, you are required to spend two years out in the countryside working in local clinics in, you know, family medicine and practical medicine and just helping the regular people who don't have doctors themselves um, before you can go on to work in Havana or wherever you actually want to work. It is interesting to me, and it's not something that I've really connected in the past before, but it does seem like in uh, third world socialist countries, the things that the government mostly uh, spend money on are education and um, healthcare, exactly. Those seem to be, and it makes total sense. If you were to structure... Uh, a, a society without mo without a profit being a motive in your mind, then those would be things that you would be very interested in and invested in to further your um, country. Not not just yeah. from an economic point of view, which it absolutely does help too, but also just from a human point of view, is that you you want people to have the best knowledge available presented to them, and you mm -hmm. also want to make sure that people have the you know uh, help when they need it in form of healthcare and in form of good health care um, yeah. and those are things that uh, you know if you look at how capitalist society in pretty much all of Europe and the US is is structured uh, teachers don't make that much money <laughs> and like doctors are like, progressively being held back by by legislation and bureaucracy and um, 
and just restrictions. By market logic. Market logic, Most exactly. Most doctors, um, like the majority of doctors that aren't specialized, don't make that much money either. Mm-hmm. Ma- uh, and make about as much as teachers do. Yeah, um, absolutely. But people still become teachers. People still become educators. People still become doctors. And I think that goes into your uh, humans are good thing as well. Because who can you think of that has a more stressful life than a doctor? And like mm-hmm. these people choose to be doctors. And if you ask most of them, I don't think they'll say it's for the money. It's because they no, want to feel like they're making not. a difference. Yeah. And I mean, I yeah. know uh, several people who have gone into like family medicine um, and that kind of stuff. And like they do not expect to be making money at all. I mean, they they expect to earn basically enough money to have an apartment and live a you know middle class life ish, like lower middle class. Yeah, and they have very little uh, free time. They have very little yeah. time just for themselves. They're basically living on the job on call all the time in case of an emergency. So yeah. these people really uh, feel that this is something that is helping people. Not from a that they're not helping themselves because they could be just shilling something or uh, like going into some specific field, but they choose not to. Yeah, and I mean, yeah. They instead of going to family medicine, they could be going into urology or radiology. Mm-hmm some some specialized uh, field of medicine which could make them way m- much like way 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 more money plastic they surgery would also, mm-hmm, they would also be treating fewer people mm-hmm. and you know they would be less needed because there is a lack of just regular medicine uh, doctors of medicine oh um, yeah like tens the, the, in the US there's a shortage of like tens of thousands of them um, that are needed in order to actually provide healthcare for everyone who needs it. There's a huge um, lack of doctors in Denmark too, also because of our immigration policies that we're not getting the people from the outside, and we're not, and people don't want to, like, we're not filling these jobs of, of that. We need a lot of doctors out in in the countryside, basically, and no one mm-hmm. wants to live there, and no one like goes there. Uh, so we don't educate enough. We don't let in people from other countries, and no one's willing to move there. So that's a that's a huge problem that no one's doing anything about. But, you know, yeah. like that's been a problem for 10 years, 15 years. A lot of places have one doctor for a town of 60,000 people. It's insane. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. That is insane. Yeah. Right. Um, I had, like, one last thing to say about Cuba. Healthcare and, and education is basically the smartest thing that they could have invested in uh, over all these years for so many different reasons. Um, from a diplomatic point of view the breakthroughs in uh, medical science uh, I mean they've invented numerous new techniques and vaccines for for example mother to child uh, HIV which they have completely eliminated mm. uh, as well as a vaccine for lung cancer which they created a few years ago and um, which they have distributed freely to all of the countries of the Americas except for the United States of America which declined Cuba was basically, hey, we found a vaccine for lung cancer, do you want it? And the US was like, fuck off, dirty commie. But everyone else got it. (laughs) Nah, we want our people to die of cancer before injecting them with your communist nonsense. Oh, America Um, with your big dick energy. (laughs) Oh, better dead than red. But, uh, I mean, the the South American countries, um, uh, South and Central American countries and, and Caribbean countries, which have received uh, the medical support from Cuban doctors have gained, you know, a lot of respect for the Cuban government, uh, which is good seeing as how, you know, the Monroe Doctrine and US dominance and hegemony in, in the Americas has been trying to turn the opinion against Cuba for a long time. But that's kind sure, of yeah. now, because, I mean, basically South American countries don't like the US anymore. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if you noticed. I wonder but, uh, why. That's weird. <laughs> I mean, what is yeah. what has North what? America ever done to South America? That's so that's yeah. so random. What what has US been up to there? It's so weird. During World War Two, the US basically um, provided blanket uh, guarantees for every nation in you know, on the American continent, uh, basically saying that if any German or Japanese or anything ships or planes went anywhere near any country 
on the American continent, uh, then the U.S. would declare war on their behalf. Wow. So, so that's kind of where that comes mm-hmm. from, the Monroe Doctrine and the U.S. dominance in the in the region. Mm-hmm. And also the U.S. just kind of overthrows all of the governments they don't like, so that helps as well. It's really, yeah, it's really gross the way liberals uh, talk about, uh, about about Venezuela these days. If you if you notice it, like uh, Bill Maher talked about Venezuela, like that's our backyard, and they're suffering down there. And you just go like, is it your backyard? I thought it was a huge country that existed far away from your own. Yeah. Like, how can you how can you as like someone who who talks of a big game about like social justice and justice for minorities? also turn around and say uh, Venezuela is our backyard like that's just the most <laughs> terrible thing you could possibly call an independent nation yeah uh, I think it was it was either him or I think maybe John Oliver who was talking who described um, Cuba as being America's angry ex-girlfriend like uh excuse me <laughs> like, oh who yeah the fuck's no, up relationship was, um, is that <laughs> oh god what was it it was um, what was that uh it Jim, was Jim uh, Jeffries. It sounds like Jim Jeffries. No, it, it was John Oliver. No. It was about Guantanamo yeah, Bay John Oliver. and how the U.S. has been sending uh, money to Cuba, to the Cuban government, to lend or or to to um, yeah, to lease Guantanamo Bay, mm. and Cuba has been not cashing them in and saying, you know, we're not we're not lending this this land to you. It's ours go away and the US just keeps sending them money that they never cash and because of like inflation the the amount of money that the US sends each year is like a thousand dollars for all of Guantanamo Bay <laughs> and, and I think John Oliver said that um, that the US was like Cuba's angry grandparent or something because sending them like really minuscule amounts of money whilst not talking to them mm. basically yeah. Uh, there's actually one with maybe it was someone else in movie who's just describing Cuba as like an angry ex girlfriend who was like completely in the wrong and it's like You know what I what that, kind like, of fucked up relationship have you been in where like you like I don't know keep this person, you know, basically locked up in your basement for a while and then they escape and you're like, Hey, what the fuck? Yeah. And then you're surprised that this person doesn't like you anymore like the there's fuck? there's very little i dislike more than smug liberal satirists like they uh, john ah, the oliver list. samantha b especially uh the daily show all those people that just make careers out of wittily i guess retelling the news in a way that where i think it, it originally came like out of john stewart's way of satirizing the idea of 24 hour news what they're just doing now is just reading stuff and it's it's not it doesn't even have a joke to it but i think you're supposed to as a woke person laugh at just the premise and the way they tell the story uh for being brave I think that's that's what they want us to think as viewers is because they're telling this story from the news, they're being brave by, just by doing that. And that ma- also makes you obligated to be someone who has to laugh at it because this is a comedy show ostensibly. So you have to laugh at them being brave enough to tell the joke. And like that's so infuriatingly unfunny and also incredibly smug if you actually listen to what they're saying. Like l- take a script of someone like John Oliver and remove the jokes and it's just someone sitting in a chair going this is really really bad this is really really bad this is really really bad under the guise of comedy and it's 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 incredibly sinister when you think about it because if you ask any of them to 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 stand by what they're saying they can justify it by just saying oh no no one should take what i'm saying seriously i'm just a comedian but they're not telling any jokes and they're just retelling the the news uh, with a very heavy neoliberal often slant where it's it's and they're not in any way they don't feel in any way accountable for what they're talking about they just go off by like um anger and and the 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 woke crowd responds with laughing at appropriate times and i think it's really it's really cringy and also i i think a little scary when you think about it how do you mean scary because it's it's uncritical like it's it's 
the audience that laughs at it, I don't think they, if you talk to them about what it is uh, that John Oliver is talking about or Samantha Bee is talking about, they're not saying that joke was so funny. They're saying that it's so brave that they're even doing what they're doing. And that makes it funny, even though it isn't funny. So like they will they will applaud anything that they're saying and like go along with whatever message that someone like Samantha B or John Oliver is saying just for the fact that they even exist. And I think if that's what we're accepting as comedy and as satire, then I think we're we're going to go down a very bad route that's going to end up biting liberals in the ass because uh, I mean that can be implemented just as easily to the right wing. I mean it's just it's uncritical uh, group think, uh, like patting yourselves and your movement on the back without like really listening to what this person is saying. Don't have that much to add to that specifically. I can't say I've ever really watched them. I mean, I watched John Oliver, and um, I, th- I feel like John Oliver is uh, a nice way for me to stay up to date on what the fuck is going on in America because I don't get American news otherwise. Sure. Yeah, I will say I think he's Fair he's enough. probably the best one at it right now. Uh, but still, I think he he's hiding behind that liberal detachment, and, and he's he's not to me. He's not doing a comedy show. He's just throwing in random little quips from time to time uh, to to make yeah. it appear like a comedy show. But really, he's doing his take on the news, like biased news. Yeah, I mean, sure. Well, I can't stand his humor, to be honest. So I don't watch him. Uh. Right. Anyway, uh, <laughs> yeah, that was a very big sidestep. <laughs> if uh, that was a big sidestep. If you have an uplifting gonna... story to share, <laughs> <laughs> we're doing the uplifting thing. I forgot. <laughs> In the middle of the uplifting thing, I brought up fucking liberal late night hosts. Uh, uh, yeah. um, oh, if whatever. you have an uplifting story to share, it can be historical or personal or just an anecdote that makes you feel good. Then you can send it to shitislandshow at gmail dot com. I don't want to shit on any other like liberal late night TV hosts. Right. Yeah, sure. Send us an email about that too. Send in whatever send us, you want. Just, if you just want to talk, you know, if you're just feeling lonely, just you know, send us an email. <laughs> and once again, that's how you're feeling. That is a real email address: shitislandshow <laughs> at gmail dot com. We promise it's real. It's not yeah. going to get bounced if you send us an email. <laughs> no, no, send an email. Yeah. Um, if you want to speak to any of us specifically, just put it in the email. You know. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Uh, you can also talk to us on our, uh, or not our, but on the Discord server, on the Asher Scapegoat Discord server, where we all, you know, spend Hang time from time to time. Do stuff. Oh yeah, and follow me on Twitter, where I struggle to figure out how to use Twitter. It's it's yeah. adorable. <laughs> I'm pretty adorable on Twitter, if I may say so myself. Uh, twi- uh, well, Peter is very adorable indeed. Yeah. Peter's uh, Twitter link is in the description below this video. Or if you're listening to this on on something else, uh, too bad. Yeah. Yeah. Go fuck yourself. At the Peter Rhodes. I, I don't have anything to plug here except that I'm also on the goat server. Yeah. Uh, come hang out on the Discord server. Come, come say hi to me. Yeah. Jules well, is well, very. Well if you're shy. She she's gonna be the one that lets you into the server. She's wonderful. Yeah, most likely. Um, our next topic concerns uh, drugs and drug use. And why you should all do drugs, kids. Drugs are fun. Well, mm. that's your stance on it, Jules. <laughs> 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 and this is why we're in the adult section of podcast stores. This is why Indeed. the podcast marks as explicit. <laughs> explicit. We talk about Indeed. dicks and drugs. Indeed. We do. Uh, so, uh, a, if you... There's a famous Dutch song once said, all the kids say yes to MDMA. <laughs> Uh, so just th- that's just a warning. If you don't like the topic of drugs, if you don't want to listen to us talk about drugs, then uh, you can t- tune out now. All right. Are they gone? Yes. I hope they okay, are. Okay. Good. Good. Now let's all shoot cocaine into our eyeballs. Finally, I've been waiting for this for ages. <laughs> so. All right. Ready. Uh, what we the the kind of topics you know, that I thought of concerning drugs was uh, what is the future of drugs um, either in the society we live in now or in a potential future socialist society? What should drug use look like? How should it be used? Should drugs exist at all? Will they exist? Um, And 
the different there are different perspectives to look at drugs from um, one of which is looking at it from an individualist point of view and the individual the individual rights of each person to choose what they do with their body uh, versus the collective well-being of the entire society and you know do we want people who are on drugs to live in or or like do we want the people who live in our society to do a bunch of drugs or do we want everyone to be you know clear-minded and work towards the betterment and improvement of everyone's lives and if we do go for that collectivist uh viewpoint uh where does it end and will we end up with a so-called father knows best state Mm. uh, where the the government just sort of tells you what is morally and ethically correct to think well i think excellent questions and they're very hard to answer i think uh just Mm -hmm. because the the whole concept of drugs themselves is a very political and uh like uh, moral thing it's a very it's 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 kind of a moral and political evaluation that determines what is and isn't drugs at this point because if you go back 10 years ago um, medical marijuana was completely obscene to talk about. You couldn't even talk about using it for anything, uh, and and any discussion about marijuana was basically uh, how criminal should it be. And mm-hmm. it's only like it seems to be that as as we move along, opinions change and um, like um, traditions change, so that we can include some uh, some drugs into the acceptable drugs line and then and, and this time move on others fall out of favor and become mm-hmm. illegal so it's yeah it's first i think you would have to define what constitute drugs what constitutes yeah. drugs and from there you can move on to say should they be in socialist society because i mean technically coffee is a drug like any mm-hmm. caffeine is a drug uh nicotine yeah. is a drug um so like where do you draw the line are you drawing the line by what's acceptable right now or by uh, chemical definitions yeah it's mm-hmm. it's not easy um, I uh, would probably go with the what are the potential harms and the side effects of using the drug. Right. Because overdosing on coffee is technically possible, but you would your body would be peeing out the coffee faster than you could drink it if you really wanted to try to overdose on coffee. Oh yeah, um, absolutely. And coffee addiction is a thing, um, but the nastiest side effects that you can get, I mean, from cof- from withdrawal, you can get a headache, mm-hmm. and from regular usage, you can get jittery, mm-hmm. and that's about it, unless you have any allergies or, or anything that makes you vulnerable. Um, coffee is, uh, yes, it's technically a drug, but it's not going to ruin your life. In fact, it's probably going to improve it if, you know, you have a regular 9 to 5 job, you mm-hmm. need to stay awake. Or you have an essay to write, whereas, um, you know, heroin and alcohol, both can be abused seriously and can ruin both your life and the life of others. Uh, I mean, just drunk driving is an example of something that happens as a side effect of alcohol, but also, you know, domestic abuse, something that happens as a result of alcohol, and heroin. I mean. It's pretty obvious you get hooked on it, and it's the most addictive substance that exists mm-hmm. on Earth. And uh, I know it's great. You just sell your belongings on Earth uh, in order to get more money to buy heroin, and nothing matters except heroin. And heroin just takes over your entire life, and eventually, all you're doing is you sit in a room and you do heroin until you die, mm. um, unless you get clean. Uh, which is basically the end of all stories concerning heroines. Either you die or you get clean. Mm. The, like, I have never heard of, and especially never met someone who was a heroin user who I was like, yeah, that like seems like a... casual like a, heroin uh, user, you know, like a casual drinker. <laughs> like a casual heroin user. But like, I've yeah. never met, like, a responsible heroin user. Or like mm. a... Yeah, you know, just, you know, once a week yeah. with my friends, just like a, off a needle, you know. Like a well-adjusted member of society who also happens to do heroin. Mm. Uh, and like, I'm, oh, I don't do heroin, I just do it socially with my friends mm. at parties and stuff. <laughs> That's not a thing. 
I mean, some people say they do that, but I doubt it as well. Yeah. Uh, no. Yeah. yeah. It's it's. Come on, yeah. I've seen train spotting. I'm sure it happens. Yeah. Um, okay, so that seems to be like a collective, and I, I'm very in line with what you said. Uh, like that seems to be like a co- collective well-being argument. But what, say, what if you're like yeah. a liberal socialist who believes that uh, drugs are fine, heroin is fine, it should be legal because that's up to the individual, and if the individual chooses to uh, do heroin and, and destroy their life, then what's the problem with that, basically? I do believe in, in individual liberties, um, mm. probably more so than you know most Marxist-Leninists that I've come across on the internet. Um, <laughs> well, you're not a Marxist-Leninist, are you? Uh, and um, uh, I, I do ma- like mainly agree with the sentiment that the government shouldn't be there to tell you what is right and what is wrong. For mm-hmm. example, when it comes to marriage, just in general, I don't think the government should have a hand in marriage at all. I think it should be a cultural and a traditional thing. Uh, it shouldn't be a legal thing. Uh, the government shouldn't be there to tell you who you're together with. Like the gov- That's not the government's business. Agreed, yeah. Um, and you know, just with... Like, like the government shouldn't tell you what clothes to wear, what car to drive... And that kind of thing. Whoa, 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 whoa! <laughs> no car driving. Come on, what is this? Uh, I mean, from from a, I mean, from a stylistic <laughs> point of view, I mean, the environmental aspect yeah, is a fair enough. argument. Um, but I think when it comes to alcohol and uh, you know hard drugs, they remove they they make you into someone else essentially alter your mental state i think they call it yeah yes um to the point where you don't fully control your actions anymore right and you are much more likely to hurt other people Mm. and individual liberties shouldn't be an excuse for you to hurt others Uh, even if it's by accident like if you get drunk and you get in a car with your kids and your wife in the back seat. I mean, that's not. Mm. So yes, I understand the argument that people are, you know, individuals and they should have rights, but like you don't have the right to hurt others. And yeah. When you do hard drugs and when you do abuse alcohol, you will eventually hurt others or yourself. Hmm. I mean, just statistically speaking, it's pretty much impossible that you would get away with abusing alcohol and not hurt someone else or yourself Mm. well i mean it does it does seem very uh, reasonable to me to to say that you should evaluate drugs on a severity scale and on an addiction Mm. scale as well because some drugs like you mentioned uh, morphine is just so intensely attractive to our um, biology that we yes. immediately form or almost immediately form an addiction to it and it has the potential to destroy our lives. Um, but uh, then, like you also, like you mentioned, alcohol. Alcohol is a very severe drug um, and as yes. is sugar to yeah, an extent. Yeah. Like you, you're you very quick to form an addiction to sugar uh, and that, that can have very oh. devastating effects <laughs> on... Uh, I thought you said yogurt. Yogurt, oh yeah. I heard the same actually. Yogurt, oh my god. Like, a yogurt is addictive? You can be addicted to yogurt. Very. It's a very <laughs> severe <laughs> drug, guys. Yogurt is a very <laughs> severe drug and it can ruin your life if you're not careful. Yeah, yeah no, they don't have a build up, you know, the resistance to it. They can immediately hook some stuff. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but um, I, I meant to say sugar, and sugar can have a very. A very devastating effect on your life as well because you see a lot of people who like become very addicted to sugar uh, and, yeah. and and people talk about nicotine being as difficult to quit as heroin and uh, obviously like it's it not. doesn't that's well, bullshit well i mean mayo clinic no, I've, a bunch I've, of I've, research. I've talked to a doctor about it and, and he was like no that's not a thing heroin right. and, and morphine are a lot harder to to quit because like um Maybe maybe it's on a psychological level. I don't know. It doesn't. It but it, it's it it's beside the point entirely. Yeah. But like yeah, I I agree. There should be some severity measurement in it. Um. And I think it's it should be also okay to discuss, um, why some drugs are illegal, which are better for you than some of the drugs who are that are legal currently. Because mm-hmm. I think a lot of um, and I think Adorno talked about this. Shout out to Adorno in the episode. Uh, <laughs> that uh, like drug culture has always been associated with this 
uh, otherness that we portray in Western culture, that it's different and scary and uh, out of the light and in darkness. And like um, he used the term uh, representative for oriental ethnic uh, and ethics and religion. So ethnicity, ethics and religion. I think he's talking about morphine there. That is he's mm. kind of saying like it's this dark continent, scary third world thing coming and quote unquote invading us. Whereas like other things that come from other continents like tobacco, which don't alter our brain chemistry the same way are, uh, have, has been adopted into the us uh, or the self, if you will. Um, so yeah, I think, I think there's some secret racism also to the way we look at illegal drug culture uh, in the West. Sure. Um, I mean, I'm of the opinion that um, I guess alcohol and tobacco and to an extent sugar uh, should shouldn't be promoted. Um, I'm not saying prohibition now, prohibition forever. I'm just saying tone it down a notch. Like, for example, don't have tobacco commercials or alcohol commercials. Mm. Uh, like, don't, or don't have sales um, for for alcohol or tobacco, and maybe introduce a sugar tax and that mm. kind of thing. Um, now, the rational part of me fully agrees, but my inner alcoholic is screaming at you. <laughs> I mean, you can drink alcohol. She's very angry at you. She's very, yeah, but no more alcohol sales. How am I going to get my cheap alcohol? She's very angry at you now, the inner alcoholic. Um. <laughs> But yeah, no, you are right. It's mm. uh, not great. Uh, but I think I think um, we all agree that the that drug all drugs should be decriminalized. Oh yeah. yes, yes, uh, and not you know come with a thirty-year prison sentence because yeah. that's not helping anyone. That would be good. Um, does it mean it? cost the taxpayers a bunch of money to put someone in a prison and it's not going to help that person get clean mm. um, that person is most likely just going to go out, go back to doing drugs and then go back to prison after a year um, so I think rehabilitation is key to people who have addiction problems to really terrible stuff um, like cocaine or heroin but also alcohol if you have a you know, a big problem with that. Oh, uh, yeah, alcohol addiction. Not fun, kids. Yeah. Not recommend. Yeah, alcohol addiction. Alcohol addiction is a very serious illness. Um, if you if you know someone who is addicted to alcohol or is an alcoholic, then you'll know how, how much it, it absolutely defines your life the same way that uh, morphine addiction would. And everything yeah. does become about alcohol, and it, it, it really ruins and destroys your body in a very horrific way. And it is one of the few addictions that can actually kill you. Mm. So yeah, be careful with that stuff. I mean, it also yeah. hurts the people around you, especially if you have a family and you're alcoholic. Oh yeah. That's going to hurt your relationship with them and their relationship with you. Absolutely. But then what do, we, what do we say to people, like the, the people who are like, uh, why, why do you want, why, why should, who, who elected you to, to, to tell me that I can and can't drink? Or like, why, why should this nanny state decide like, yeah. <laughs> what, uh, what I put in my body? That's not, that's not well, my, your responsibility. I'm a grown adult, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Well, partly we already do that, though, with all kinds of just general like regulations we have on like uh, you know the safety of food and you know you can't have asbestos in your seating anymore that's, you know, it's not <laughs> yeah, the end of sure. i mean i uh, that's not entirely an argument that well that's just the way it is but but uh, I, I i understand people who say well the nine state can't tell me what to do it's my body it's my choice mm. and i agree with that sentiment in, in principle but like i mentioned that when you do heroin or cocaine or crystal meth it no longer is your body and your choice because your mind is altered to the point where you don't have control over it anymore mm. and so you can say well i'm a responsible adult i can make my own decisions it you know hold me responsible if i do something but i just want to do drugs well the thing is if you do drugs uh it's very likely that you will end up hurting someone or yourself 
without meaning to do it, even if you are a responsible adult when you're sober. Right. So it's not that the, we want you to st- stop having fun. It's just that we want to protect the people around you and you. I mean, there have been plenty of cases of people who are high off their nuts and just decide that they can fly and jump off a building. Hmm. I just thought of a great idea to you know solve that problem. What if we bring back opium dens? <laughs> you can go in there. Have your opium in a safe environment, you know. If something goes wrong, there's people there to help you. You know, bring back opium then. <laughs> opium is uh, maybe not as bad, but definitely up there uh, together with heroin. Oh, well, you know, you can, you can do other things there. You can do heroin, you can do like crack, you know, you can do whatever you want, you know. It's uh, so like nanny state safe spaces for drug addicts. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, I'm in favor. Yeah, I mean, um, sort of. They sort of do that with bars, don't they? Where you know, if you get to a certain level of drunk, they're not allowed to serve you anymore right? because it's, yeah. it's clear that you're kind of just going to be a danger to yourself or others. Like they're not allowed. They, but to serve they do you. also just let you go home after you yeah, become they very drunk. Yeah, maybe be a little stricter about this, but <laughs> and I guess the principle should, is already there in a way. Do you do you guys have those? Um, I guess I'm asking from from like a national point of view. Those rooms where addicts can go and shoot up safely. No, I have no idea. I don't think actually, so. we do in Copenhagen. I think we have specific uh, rooms where people can go for clean needles and where they can go and I shoot up. I think we might. I think that's the closest that I've heard anyone. I heard something that we had something along those lines, but it wasn't from a very reliable source that I heard this. So I yeah, I think I think the room too much. Uh, yeah, no, I think I think the rooms are 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 from the point of view of if you get addicts in there, you have a chance to help them or to give them advice or to, you know, give them materials and and stuff for and and phone numbers for people to call if they decide to get clean or whatever. Um, Basically, yeah. bash them over the head with a Bible. Basically, yeah, <laughs> just moralize the hell out of of their drug people. Have some yeah, old people standing in the one of my have some uh, old people standing in a corner shaking their heads violently as they're shooting up, <laughs> like that kind of stuff. Yes. Oh, but I very distinctly remember when I was in primary school, we saw like this really shitty Dutch movie on like, and I think like some sixteen-year-old girl wants to be a dancer or whatnot, and then her evil boyfriend gave her like this one pill of ecstasy and uh, she was basically a heroin addict after that it's like hmm. yeah and at the time we were like i don't know 10 we didn't question it was like oh ecstasy is fucking terrible apparently and yeah I'm- i don't know a few years later it's just like i don't know this stuff's fine just I don't know. Um, take twenty of these pills. Just, be, just take one. Yeah, I mean, I'm a little older than you two, and I remember the narrative was definitely weed when I was growing up. Is don't do weed, you will die if you do weed. Weed is the uh, worst. I missed the whole weed thing. At that point, weed had been sort of accepted around here. It's like, yeah, yeah I fine. think I think weed has been acceptable way longer in the Netherlands than everywhere else because you kind of yeah. you got it, like you understood that like it's it's fine. <laughs> I mean, our laws around us still complete bullshit, but at least culturally we understand. Like, ah, this stuff's fine. Yeah, legally it's still on a complete fucking mess, but it's it's yeah, it's that side definitely <laughs> softening the rhetoric in Denmark about weed. It's still very, um, it's still it's still driven by stereotypes and and I think wrong conclusions. But it's a more honest discussion now about weed in in Denmark than I've ever experienced in my life. It's. It seemed to be one of those things that you could just dismiss as never a couple of years ago, and now it's like legalization is is more of a topic that uh, people are having and taking seriously. Sweden is uh, definitely still against uh, legalization of marijuana. I think recent. I don't know how recent it was, but I saw a poll that was about like upwards of ninety percent of Swedes are against legalization Jeez. of marijuana. Hmm. That's a lot. Um, and I mean, we're, we also have like strict alcohol laws and, and like we restrict purchasing of alcohol. Um, yeah. And, and that kind of thing. So we, we do take that stuff seriously and like mind altering drugs seriously. You have always been um, more abolitionists than we have down south in Denmark. Um, but yeah. I, yeah, I mean, 10 years ago, you'd probably seen the same stats from Denmark that 90% didn't want weed legalized. But now it's close to like 70% of Danes thinking it should be legalized. Mm, yeah. Um, I think uh, um, 
if it ever came to a national referendum, I would probably vote against legalizing marijuana. Mm. Not because I think marijuana is worse than alcohol. I think it's better than alcohol. But I don't think that the solution to alcoholism is introducing a new kind of drug that you can try. But as but well. aren't you then uh, at the same time doing that thing of endorsing criminalization of the drug? Because you can still you can decriminalize a drug and like uh, mm. and not legalize it. You know what I mean? Like you can you can. No, I'm for decriminalization, but not legalization. Okay, but that would be the referendum, I'm assuming. Like, the, the should it be criminalized, marijuana? Because right now it is criminalized. Well, I, I don't know. I, 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 I assumed it would be a referendum about legalizing. Or yes recreationally, or no. like recreational use. Yes. Okay, that's different. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know what yeah. I would want. I mean, medi- medicinal marijuana, I'm, I'm fine yeah. with. Um, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not educated within the medical academics um i do have a few friends who are like at my university who are like going to become nurses and stuff Mm -hmm. but um my understanding is that marijuana medical marijuana does have a place and it can be used for certain conditions but it's not always the best treatment and in some cases it's kind of pointless when it's prescribed and it's just prescribed because the doctor likes weed and the patient wants weed. Oh, I disagree. Um. <laughs> <laughs> no, but see, the, the, the thing is, like, um, it depends on what you, you prescribe. Because if you prescribe, like, blunts, then yes, your doctor just like weed, just likes weed. But, um, yes. like, the, the cannaboid, the cannaboid, is that what it's called? Cannaboid? Uh, uh, oils? I think so. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Anyway, the oils yeah. don't get you high. And they're often like um, uh, the mildest thing you can take for a disease. And a lot of the things that they've been used for, they've shown to be really good at actually uh, helping with things that you were using morphine for in the past or these very heavy duty drugs. And they are able to do the same, attain the same results in patients uh, just using these yeah, oils uh, from from that that don't get you high and don't have any psychedelic effects on your brain or anything and don't are, are just basically extracted from from the the uh, plant. Yeah, that I'm I'm completely fine with. And if the like, <laughs> I guess I'll just give all of my opinions <laughs> on this show. Might as well. Um, I'm if there were if there were referendums on the following things, I would vote against legalization. I would vote for decriminalization mm. and i would vote for medical marijuana okay yeah so i'm fine with medical marijuana uh just not necessarily you know being prescribed blunts for having a broken leg or whatever mm. but which was a thing in the u.s uh when medical marijuana first became a thing is people just went to the doctor and was like i have a headache give me mm. weed which went away when weed was legalized but that's not really the yeah. Anyway. No, I know that. Um, I mean, it's it's a it's a heavy topic, and I completely get the the restraint. I think one of the only proposals that I've agreed with the social liberal libertarian party in Denmark with is they proposed a way of doing it where we decriminalize, basically, like you said, decriminalize marijuana, and um, and you know allowed medical marijuana, which I think today medical marijuana is legal in Denmark, actually. Um, but uh, and then mm. do basically what they call a trial run on um, on medical uh, marijuana in a bigger scale. So like for like you saw in the U.S., if you have anxiety or if you have back pain or if you have um, all these things that you would normally prescribe with heavy duty drugs like morphine or whatever or morphine based drugs, give them marijuana instead uh, like they did in the U.S., which, you know, led to uh, recreational use eventually being allowed. Um, and th- that's that's a proposal that they came out with that I thought was very reasonable because I think if you go from uh, like if you go from criminalizing weed to suddenly legalizing recreational weed, I think there is a risk. You do run a risk of of just turning everyone into to, to weed users out of curiosity. Um, that might be very hysterical and a sign of me growing up in the '90s or whatever, but that does seem to be. Uh, that is something that people are worried about anyway, and that I'm worried about as well. If you do, I'd that. be worried if everyone suddenly start liking Elon Musk. It'd be a fucking nightmare. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I guess something else that 
I, I'll, um, I might get some backlash for even saying, and, and people might call me a pseudoscientist. Oh, or boy. like a conspiracy okay, theorist. Okay, hot take alert. <laughs> okay, we're ready. Uh, no, but I am not convinced that weed is uh, perfectly healthy in the long run. Whoa! Because there haven't been... Hot take. Because there haven't been that much research done on it, on recreational use of mm. marijuana. Uh, and smoking it and using it regularly for you know forty years or whatever because it is a sort of recent phenomenon. Phenomenon. Oh uh, yeah, fair enough. Well, in the and so there there are uh, there are possible side effects that we haven't foreseen that will manifest themselves in a few years. Well, I mean, we do have that we might discover. Uh, it's a new thing. I agree. It's a new thing in the West, but if you look to Asia, for instance, or Africa where it's not been demonized the same way that we've demonized it in the West, they have for generation and generation actually smoked weed um, and uh, not seen those. So, so we do have a lot of, of, of medical data which show that it is supposedly perfectly fine in the long run if you ingest marijuana. Um, what, the things that we don't have data on are um, productivity, like what uh, impact does it have on people's productivity, on their uh, intellectual capabilities? Do, do you become dull after 40 years of smoking weed? Um, do you, like, does, your, <laughs> does your ability to think critically go down? Um, I mean, all data points to no, but we don't have, like you said, those long-term surveys. But yeah, I mean, in terms of the uh, danger, the direct health danger of weed after long-term use, we have way more data on that than we do on, say, e-cigarettes or something like that, which is d definitely yeah, sure. a new phenomenon. But um, yeah, no, this, is, this is why uh, this is why I only take alcohol in our time-tested drug. <laughs> <laughs> it stood the test of time yeah, as just great sure. indeed. <laughs> and it's, it's just the best yeah. for you. Drink, drink Carlsberg, everyone. Um, consume, consume. I think just in in general, taking any drug um, before your brain has fully developed, so while you're still young, is a bad idea. Yes, yeah. don't drink alcohol at seventeen, kids. Drink it at eighteen. It's good for you then. <laughs> your brain is still developing at eighteen. Ideally, you should be waiting longer than that. But I realize. Me saying that is not going to change any teenager's mind Smart. about having a yeah no <laughs> having alcohol the moment they turn eighteen. I mean, yeah. But I think in in general, doing any kind of drug should wait until you are older in your twenties. I mean, um, it's yeah, it's it's an it's an old uh, tradition that kids will rebel against society or their parents or their brothers or their friends or whatever through getting high or getting drunk and like that's just. Mm -hmm. uh. Uh, but don't if you are going to do it, you know. Do it once. Send us an email. Uh, Tell us how it wins. <laughs> send us an email. Don't do it. Don't do it regularly. Don't do it, yeah, do it no. recreationally and, and regularly, because it will, in the long run, affect the development of your brain, which is not good. Uh, yeah. And that is something I believe that weed has been shown that it, it does affect the development of the brain if you you use it when you're young. Oh yeah. And still a developing little boy yeah, every drug base everything you put in your body until your your body's fully grown does have an effect on the way you develop and like you don't want to to feed your body a bunch of shit while you're growing up and and becoming you, your own person because it's gonna yeah, yeah don't, like don't pass your blunt to the five-year-old yeah that's what we're saying trust me your body your body <laughs> is cursed enough as it is you don't want to curse it any more than absolutely <laughs> necessary <laughs> Oh, speak Basically, for yourself. eat eat healthy. Don't do anything bad until you turn twenty five, and after that, only eat microwave pizza and do everything. It's drug free notice. game, baby. Yeah, twenty five, <laughs> you can do heroin just fine. Just go crazy. You've earned it, kiddos. If you're if you're twenty two, yeah. listening to this, blaze if it. If you manage to hold out that long, then fucking blaze it. Do it. Heroin's fine. Go don't. No. Yep. I can't believe First I just said that. From oh, yeah, no, no, I can't believe I just said. Don't do heroin. <laughs> <laughs> shit, shit Island does not uh, does not endorse the use of heroin for anyone. Most of the of inhabitants of Shit Island don't endorse it. We don't endorse it. <laughs> do we? Fine, okay, fine. We don't endorse it. Jeez. We should have a mascot called uh. Heroiny that don't do heroin bear. <laughs> hey kids, <laughs> don't do heroin. That's like the mm. lamest fucking mascot imaginable. <laughs> <laughs> heroin eaters don't do heroin, bear. 
Could you send us fan oh, art? Geez. That's the one that that would make yeah. me very happy if you drew a mascot of of a bear called Heroiny the don't do heroin. Or just bear. of us, or you know, shit art, and just send us fan art of anything, really. Yeah, but specifically the bear, please. I love you. Yeah. <laughs> that works. Uh. No, the bear doing taking a shot of heroin. <laughs> <laughs> heroin, the don't do heroin bear taking a shot of heroin in the yes, in the shit know. island comedy club. Ah <laughs> uh, yes. What's the deal with that? <laughs> yep. Seinfeld's well, on stage being upset at SJ Dubs. A show of, uh, uh, like the show of uh, <laughs> Elijah Schleswig going on. Oh, uh, Elijah Schlesinger. That has to be a topic at one point. Ah, uh, it's gonna be. It's gonna be. Do we have anything else we want to talk about this week? Um, I don't know. Just uh, addictions aren't fun. Um, how's your week been? Um, I've been great. I've <laughs> no, I haven't. I've been sick for close to two weeks now, and it sucks. I don't recommend it. Don't get the flu. It's a, a virus sent directly from Hades loins. Don't get it. It's uh, get vaccinated. Kids. To do get the flu get vaccine. the vaccine. Don't if, if they charge. Don't don't doesn't matter. Don't get it. Definitely get the vaccine. Don't don't get the flu. It's the worst. You can get it on the bus. I got yeah. it on the bus. Oh, I thought you meant you got the flu vaccine. <laughs> yeah, you just know. No. <laughs> Some guy yeah, next to you, like, the doctor, hey, okay, you know, you buy a flu the vaccine? nurse out of the hospital, you know, offered some <laughs> sexual favors for it. You want heroin? No, thanks. Flu vaccine? Ah, uh, I guess. Hell yeah. <laughs> Come on, straight to the eyeball. <clears throat> Don't trade a hand job for a flu vaccine. <laughs> no, do that, dude. Bus. That's a good it's... deal. <laughs> Unless make, it's make sure uh, it's like a legit flu uh, vaccine. Uh, don't, don't just pop anything in your veins. That's what we've been telling you. Uh, there's no style fire we'll also. Yeah, I, I, unless I guess your sexual favor for the flu vaccine is a way of you to showing that you're an empowered person in a capitalist society or something. Uh, exactly. Don't do it. <laughs> well, maybe do. We'll get to more yeah, we'll, we'll, detail in yeah. that in a future episode when we do the whole uh, sex work thing. Yeah, I'm talking out of my ass. Also, I don't know anything about sex work. I want to say. There's a myth that you can get the flu if you get a flu yeah, vaccine. It's a myth. We've been very responsible this episode, huh? Like we've talked about yeah. don't do drugs, yeah. get vaccines. Don't be a turf. Don't be a turf. Also don't one. be a turf. Yeah. Yeah. Vote for Bernie. Yep, vote for Bernie. Vote for go Bernie. vote for Bernie. <laughs> Seriously, go vote for Bernie, you motherfuckers. Go vote for him. Yeah, we're, we're turning into such lovely, respectable centrists. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> I don't know. The Wolfman supports Bernie, I guess. I hope. I didn't see the video. It's a wonderful video. Everyone go on YouTube and look up... Um, uh, uh, Richard D. Wolfman. Yes, Richard D. Wolf talking about Bernie Sanders. He filmed it in his uh, personal library, I want to say. And it looks like you're you're having a Skype conversation with your elderly father. He's just, uh, he's just too videos. close to the camera and he's looking down on the screen like, and he's going it's like a shitty old webcam yeah shitty right. old webcam he doesn't have a microphone it's so it doesn't sound the good the type of video which is perfect for me it's just like that's... you're having no. it's just like you're having a conversation with an elderly family member that doesn't know how computers work yep. doesn't know that the camera is pointed at them <laughs> and it's wonderful <laughs> and he's just the yep. best please check it out yep Thank you all for listening to this episode of Shit Island. Please send us an email. Yes, saying it's what been you... a joy. Send us an email. Join the Discord server. Join the Discord server. Follow me on Twitter. Follow the goat on Twitter. And become uh, a Patreon. Become a patron. Is there anything else we subscribe need to plug to here? The channel. Uh, subscribe, comments, like, favorite. Um, the... Ring the bell. Yeah, ring the bell. Apparently that's a thing now. Thank you for listening. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye.